Welcome to Finite Element Methods. Today we'll be discussing a special topic, and that special topic is sources of errors. Uh, typically, when you do finite element analysis, there'll be a number of errors. It could be human error, computational mechanics errors that you make. Uh, it could also be unit problems. Also, the element type, how you decide to represent the structure, could be incorrect. For example, it could be a beam type modeling but you end up using the wrong type of element, for example, to represent that behavior. We also talked about Gaussian quadrature as a potential problem when it comes to highly distorted elements where the Jacobian can, can become ill-conditioned. So in this lecture, what I plan to do is cover those aspects, and I hope we can learn quite a bit as we move through that, um, the sources of errors today. Let's go on to that next topic. Uh, so there's uh, various errors that people make when uh, you do analysis in finite elements. Um, typically, there's various sources of errors. I'll start first with user errors. So a lot of the times, there's mistakes made in the software. You'll use the wrong element type. Uh, you'll have a bad mesh uh, used. For example, here, there's a fitted. And here you can see that there's a single element across the fillet. If I want to get stresses in this fillet, that's not a great meshing. In fact, here you can see only a few elements, and you're not representing that curvature very well. So one thing you could do is use closed form solutions, use a far field stress here and here to get your be you know better solution using the handbook. Otherwise, you may want to refine the mesh in that area. As you know. Uh, linear triangle elements can also be a problem. You know, in these cases, you also want to pay attention to make sure that you, you're representing a stress field correctly. Uh, if this is an area of no concern, then perhaps it's fine, because maybe you're focusing on a different area of the structure. Um, but as you know, we've shown you that triangular elements can result in locking. You may have seen that in your homework. And so for that reason, you also want to be careful. Uh, I always look for typos. Uh, units have been a big issue in my area of expertise. Uh, typically, you know, if, if you're given a model, make sure you know what units you're working on, inches, pounds, uh, millimeters. You know, be consistent with the units, metric versus SI. Um, other areas of problems I have seen is, uh, could include uh, boundary condition errors, loads not applied properly. Um, you thought you, you included all the loads, but you didn't. So I always check your results, uh, compare, refine your mesh, do a lot of different checks. Um, so for example, other errors I've seen, uh, it, this in, from a paper I wrote, uh, if you're interested, I'll email it to you. Uh, Fader modes are not adequately, are not evaluated adequately, so you're looking at uh, for example, a brittle material, I'd rather you look at max principle because max principle is very fitter criteria for brittle materials. Uh, metals, you may want to use vomesis, but also check max principle and so forth. Um, I've also seen composites not represented correctly, so the ply angles may not be specified accurately, or the material properties could be incorrect or assumed instead of measured. Um, and so sometimes when you put the data into your model is, is done incorrectly. Uh, also, making sure that your composite properties uh, match up the orientations uh, of, of that ply. Okay. Uh, mass definitions being incorrect or different units. Um, the geometry, geometry does not compare well with CAD. It just looks different. And so that, that can be a problem. Uh, incorrect stiffness. So if you have a joint, a bolted joint, I'll show you an example. Perhaps the, the joint uh, representation is not very good uh, or is not adequately representing the behavior of that joint. Uh, using a coarse mesh in an area where you have stress risers, stress concentrations, a coarse mesh is not going to be able to pick up uh, the stress concentration very well. So you may want to refine the mesh in the area or use Hancock's if you have this far field stress. Uh, here are some examples of problems. So the drawings in one example, the material was was all along this edge in the drawing, but in the actual model, it was only represented a section of that. Uh, 
that's an example of something I've seen. Uh, for example, in the in the drawing, the cutout is here, but in actuality, the model has it shifted up, forward up. Um, I've also seen we've seen problems also with how the connections are modeled. Uh, in the drawing, there is no clips or, or some some amount of support for the joints, yet uh, the model has some clips being modeled. So so that's not representative of the reality. Uh, on other issues, you may not be able to see this very well, but uh, you know here are some other examples where uh, instead of using a beam element, it should have been represented like a solid element instead. Um, here, other examples, you have a, a, a tube, so that's a thin shell, so that makes sense. But then this one here is a solid, some sort of solid component. Well, that was represented as a beam. That, that does not look like a beam to me. And so that's going to give incorrect representation. It's better to model with solid elements there. Um, here, this base uh, may look like a plate. Sure, it looks like a plate. But the aspect ratio is not such that this dimension is thinner than the others, so therefore we got to be careful. And in this case, I will have represented this as a solid element, uh, as an example. Um, yeah, and then this is not a beam, right? This looks more like a plate, uh, but that was represented as a beam here. And so be careful how you're representing things. They, they need to be uh, representing reality. Remember, you're trying to, you're trying to. Um, idealize uh, the physical structure with elements and so you want those elements to accurately represent or or model this physical structure okay um, other problems I've seen is um, this comes from the same paper we have a beam to plate geometry so that's a connection right there and so uh, sometimes what you may want to do is constrain with the rigid bars so one the elements uh, just make sure that beam, its footprint is connected well to the shell plate through rigid elements encompassing the footprint of that cross section. Otherwise, you'll have too soft of a behavior of how that beam moves relative to that shell. Uh, a, a 2D cross section of that will be this plate coming in. So you want to have rigid body, ri rigid elements, 1D elements connecting to uh, that footprint uh, well. Uh, so you have a good connection between that plate and this plate. Um, here's a, from a paper that look at uh, different kinds of uh, joints. And in here, instead of having solid elements, con because that will be computationally expensive to model every bolt with, with solid elements, uh, one represented, representation is to have a beam, and that beam connects the surrounding uh, hole with uh, distributed coupling. Uh, RB3s or RB2s in Nastrin. Um And here, uh, there's other ways that they looked at in this paper, so I recommend you look at that. Uh, but there's plenty of papers in this area. Another approach is to convert the solid elements, these plates, abutments, into shell elements if they're long enough. So if they're thin in this direction, but long in the other directions. Then in that case, you can represent these as shells and then use a beam to connect the two shells together using uh, uh, a distributed coupling on the shell and then a beam elements represented in the bolt. Uh, important to, to recognize that that might not be an accurate representation. So making sure that that joint behavior um, matches physical reality will be a good thing. And you can do that through testing or building so, some more detailed models and, and, and ensuring that the stiffnesses are uh, uh, or, or these joint stiffnesses are, are represented well, okay? Uh, other errors that we've seen is uh, people having uh, very few elements around the hole, uh, but if it's a critical area, at least 12 elements should be used around the hole. Um, other, other issues like this one I discussed, uh, you could have a fillet, but then representing that with no elements to, to sort of represent that fillet. So if it's in a general area of no concern, not an issue, but an area of concern or an area that you want to ex explore carefully, just put more elements and, and get about three elements around that fillet. Um, other things to point out, so these are, these, for example, a joint, uh, a clamp, uh, and these are connected by spot welds. You can represent the spot welds with rigid elements, typically, 
and then these two uh, structures look like shells or plates so you can represent them represent them using the mid surface of, of these plates uh, so so that would be a good way of doing it um, if you have a fillet well some people will represent that with a, a single row of shell elements uh, again you won't uh, trust the stresses here in the fillet in the weld but you can get the stresses in a far field and then correlate the failure of that sample uh, with testing so just just do a subscale test of that fillet or try to find a way of correlating this uh, to more realistic uh, behaviors you know through testing or more detailed analysis does that make sense everybody follows excellent um, so if you have a, a, a 3D body given to you, 3D solid, and it looks like you can represent with shell elements or plate elements, uh, you can extract the mid-surface. So here's the mid-surface of that 3D body. And then just make sure your mid-surface uh, follows very well uh, and, and that you don't have some disconnections in here because uh, when you mesh it, you want to make sure you're representing the thickness of all these areas accurately. So for example, if the thickness is varying, right you want to keep track of that because then the shell elements here will ha you'll have to specify thicker or thinner depending upon how the thickness varies right uh, we know that the thickness is an important parameter for the shell elements um, and so you want to make sure you're doing that correctly applying those properties those section properties uh, accurately in the models okay any questions no um, typical model check, so when you get a model or you're constructing a model, uh, make sure that it com the dimensions match well the CAD geometry that applies, match up the drawings. Um, make sure you have material properties in the model that, that make sense, that they actually match some sort of test database or material database. Um, make sure you account for temperature dependence on the material properties so if you have an aluminum at hot temperatures or cold temperatures make sure you have the correct mechanical properties uh, for your application uh, mass properties uh, make sure your boundary conditions are good check that there's no free edges or, that could represent cracks or coincident nodes that that should not be um, if you have coincident nodes most likely you have cracks in that area so of the model so you have to go and check that um, check the surface normals of the model to make sure they're pointed in the same direction. Um, one thing that's very useful actually is to take a model once you're done, apply gravity load. Just apply like 100 Gs. Exaggerate the plots and then see if there's anything disconnected or acting weird. Uh, that has been help, helpful, helpful to, to me. Uh, do element quality checks. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and then make sure if you have... Um, uh, shell definitions, they're, they're defined properly um, and, and just make sure that whatever element type you're using, whether it's a beam, shell, solids, that they're an adequate representation of physical reality. Um, and then do rigid body checks, that's, that's a good thing to do as well. Um, and make sure that any simplif simplifications you make, say there's cutouts in the structure that you don't want to model, uh, make sure that just delete a couple elements in the area and see if it changes the load distribution. Uh, you don't have to make it perfect. So if you think a cutout doesn't really matter uh, and it's circular and you don't want to mesh that because you don't think it's going to matter, just remove a couple elements in the area, rerun the model and see if it matters, right? Because maybe that's not the area of concern in your model, right? Uh, so important things to keep in mind. Uh, other issues are dupl duplicate nodes, like I mentioned before, and in, in, in hypermesh. For example, is what the software I use typically, uh, you can actually find them quickly. So here is showing up uh, as three nodes being highlighted. Uh, duplicate elements, another one I've encountered myself actually. Uh, I create a mesh and, and I duplicated some elements because I wanted to translate or do a few things with them and I forgot to delete those duplicate elements. Well, those duplicate elements may not give you an error, uh, everything may run fine. But these duplicate elements can actually give you additional stiffness to the structure, and, and you may not be aware of it. So that's a, that's a big one I, I've encountered myself. Um, the mesh not uh, uh, matching the geometry well, we talked about that, and disconnected elements. So they'll create a crack. Uh, 
Um, so sources of, error, sources of error can also include, uh, including elements that are not of high quality. Uh, we'll talk a little more in detail about this, uh, but elements are highly distorted. We'll have a Jacobian that, that is, is, is not well defined or is ill-defined, and so uh, the more distortion you have in a Jacobian element or, or in an element, the, the, the Jacobian will, um, will be um, of a value that's not very good for, for structure analysis. And so here, uh, in Hypermesh, for example, it will give you, uh, you can click any of these buttons, and it will show you, okay, this Jacobian for this set of elements, and it will highlight them for you, has a Jacobian of 0.7. Well, a 0.7 is, is good, but if it's anything less than 0.7, then it's going to highlight them for you, and you may want to revisit those elements a little bit more. Okay? Um, aspect ratios can be a problem. So if the aspect ratio is such that usually 1 to 100 or 1 to 50, depending upon the code, uh, then the element will mis be not behave very well, and you're going to get some results that not, may not make much sense. Um, Anyway, here's the other checks. Uh, there's aspect ratio, skew, uh, cell squish, uh, length, and there's other ones you can you can check. And, and I discussed some of them here visually. Um, uh, so one way to determine whether an element is a good element or not, uh, you can visually check it as well, or uh, you can you can look at uh, a, a, a definition I'll give you very soon. But if I took uh, this square, for example. Um, for, for, for me, this is a good element because it, it, it compares very well to the standard isoparametric element. Uh, while these elements, you know, they don't look great, uh, uh, they could be okay. Uh, but if I were to use isoparametric formulation, I had to turn this highly distorted element into a square. So the Jacobian m may not be very good for that element, okay? Uh, and then these ones are great, but then this one has aspect ratios that are not very good. So how do I know uh, more qualitatively if that element is good or not? So one thing to do is that if you have, a, for example, I have a square element, and I draw a circle in the inside of that element, and I draw a circle to the outside of that element, right? So in this case, the ratio of this radius uh, is, is quite small. So if take the radius of, of the outer circle to the inner circle, that's quite, quite small. Uh, but now, if I have a highly distorted element like this one here, and I draw a circle in the inside and a circle in the outside, you can see the ratio of the radius of the circle in the outside compared to the one inscribed into that uh, rectangle uh, is, is pretty large. So, so keep this ratio small, and then that's going to basically, basically tell you that the element is of better quality. Uh, a triangular element that's highly distorted will look like that, so, so clearly it is not a good element. Um, some cases you have no choices, and so you may have bad elements and you can't do much about it. In those cases, you want to use uh, stress fields, um, uh, far field stresses to, to, to write your calculations. Uh, you will use hand calculations based on um, stress works table, uh, like, a, like a book, handbook of formulas. Bruns, or uh, there's various books out there. Peterson's stress concentration book will have a bunch of them uh, uh, where you can do hand calculations. You'll take the stress field and then you apply closed form solutions. That's sometimes a better choice than trying to refine the model. Um, other users' errors uh, are, I, I think I discussed this one, loads can be misapplied in binary conditions. Uh, numerical errors are a possibility. Nowadays, it's less of a problem. Um, most computers, uh, they're double precision, um, uh, but single precision also, And but, but this won't be a big problem in a lot of our uh, issues, in, in a lot of our problems. Um, Discretization error, so I think I discussed this quite a bit, uh, maybe a couple of lectures ago, but I, I do want to emphasize it. So P refine, there's two ways to, to refine your, your analysis. One way is to do P refinement, which is to use a higher order interpolation function for your elements. Uh, so instead of linear elements, you use quadratic elements. H refinement is basically you're taking your elements and um, meshing it with smaller element sizes. And so uh, that's one way to do it. Brute force, just 
refine the whole thing without thinking about it, um, but that may be computationally expensive. So what you may want to do is to refine in areas where there's large stress gradients. For example, if the stresses are very large here and the gradients are not very large, you don't have to refine it there. Just because the stress is high there doesn't mean you have to refine it there because maybe the stresses are not varying significantly from element to element. But the minute that the stress is very significantly and that's an area of high concern, you may want to refine the mesh uh, you know, it, to, to the point where you're capturing that stress gradient. A good rule of thumb is to see, to make sure that about two to three elements um, have about the same stress level. Okay, so uh, if I have uh, an element here that's about, I'll show you an example, I think, coming up. So, for example, here, clearly this element has a completely different stress from these elements. And so, therefore, you definitely want to refine a mesh uh, to the point that you have multiple elements that are in the same color, right? Same, uh, um, basically within 10%. Uh, and so, if you can do that, you basically have a nice mesh, a converged mesh. Some, in some cases, um, the stress, for example, in this case, is a hole uh, with a load applied, far field. In this case, you know, we're we, we, we are in good shape because this stress concentration did not change very much as I increased the mesh density. So sometimes doing these studies are very useful because it may tell you uh, what level of refinement you actually need. The reason for that is because they may not be a good payoff. I, I may have, uh, with small number of elements, I may, may be able to get to the solution. And if you have large number of elements, that's going to increase the computational time, and you don't have a huge payoff. It's going from 4.52 4 with uh, 20,000 elements, and only with 100 elements, I can probably be about 4.48. That's not a big difference, right, between 4.5 and 4.48. So, in general, my suggestion is to do some sensitivity studies and kind of gauge what kind of element size uh, you need. Uh, one thing to point out is, is the error. So I want to point out a few things. The error typically is proportional for displacements. It's proportional to the correct characteristics length to the p plus 1. Uh, and so if I increase the order of interpolation, so P is a polynomial, so if I have a linear element, this P will be 1. If it's quadratic, P will be 2. You can see as I increase P, if H is less than 1, then you expect this error to decrease. you agree? Can you see that? Another thing is that if I decrease H, then I also decrease the error. And, and, and so I'm able to do that. But if I take derivatives of this, say I take a first derivative of that, second derivative, third derivative, now the error is proportional to h to the p plus one minus r. And you can see here that even if I increase the order of interpolation, that the derivative is not going to converge as quick, or the error will not dec decrease as quick as it does for the displacements. As an example, let's take a q4 element. Uh, a q4 element, the error, so it's a linear, you agree it's a linear interpolation? Yes? So P is 1, so the error for displacement is proportional to H squared. So if I keep the element size, if I decrease the element size, uh, then it's going to, the error will decrease uh, proportional to H squared. But now when I take, when I look at strain, we know that strain is the derivative of displacement. So therefore the error will be proportional to H. And so if I decrease the element size, here you can see clearly that the error is not decreasing at the same rate as it does for the displacement. Does that make sense? So displacements will typically be uh, converge a little bit quicker than the stresses. Keep that in mind. Uh, so let's talk about quadrature error now. So quadrature error, uh, if you have a distorted elements like this node, we discussed this. If this node is not in the midst point, between the uh, on this edge, then in that case you will have on an undistorted um, or distorted element. This is actually a distorted element. No, I'm sorry. This is a uh, place in the middle. So this is an undistorted element. But if it's placed uh, away from the mid point, then it will be a distorted element. And so the Jacobian will be a rational, irrational, or, or a fraction. 
And so you're gonna, it's not gonna be an exact integration scheme. It's gonna be uh, approximate. Uh, other cases are, for example, a quadrilateral here um, is distorted because the angles are not 90 degrees. Uh, in a second order uh, quadrilateral, the midpoints are not in the center, uh, the midpoints of the edges. So in that case, that also can give you an, a, a Jacobian that does not exact, will be approximate when you use quadrature rules. Uh, another point I want to make is that uh, if the edges are not straight, that's also going to give you uh, a, a, a Jacobian that's approximate when you do the Gaussian quadrature, the integration schemes, okay? Are you guys following? Yes? Uh, so, in these cases, um, you will have some error in the Jacobian calculation, okay? Now, if this is a square, right, a perfect square, um, then the Jacobian will be a constant value and you'll be able to integrate that fairly well, okay? I believe a rectangular element will also be okay. Okay. Uh, so there are uh, various integration schemes uh, that can be used. Full integration, uh, I don't know if you recall, but for the Timoshenko beam, we did full integration and remember what happened to those elements? It locked, it has sheer locking. And then we found that, you know, we have to use less accurate integration point, you know, integration, uh, um, basically less accurate uh, no, or less number of integration points to integrate uh, the stiffness matrix. And we, we found we actually improved the solution doing that. So full integration for the most part, in almost all cases, um, is going to be the proper solution to a lot of, a lot of our problems. Be careful because when you use abacus, abacus by default will usually default to reduce integration right away. Like if you're going to use a brick element, I, I believe by default it will give you C3D8R. Well, that makes sense because it will save you computational time and it's probably okay. But in a lot of our problems, that might, might not be okay. All right? Because, and I'll discuss that. But point is that full integration uh, for a linear element, you, just one point is enough. Uh, if you have a quadratic element, two points is enough. If you have a cubic element, three points is enough, okay? Uh, but if you have highly distorted elements, now you may need more quadrature points. And so in those cases, uh, using full integration may be the right thing to do. For Timoshenko, we saw that that was a problem and, and we did not get a very good result with full integration, if you recall that. Uh, and so, also, full integration is computationally expensive because I have to calculate all these integrals. Uh, I have to evaluate them at the integration point. So the more integration points I have, the more calculations I have to do. As you, I think as you're experimenting, or as you may have experimented in this homework. I don't know if you, if you experienced the pain. But, uh, okay. Um, furthermore, uh, for, for one, uh, bilinear or, or, or linear quadrilateral elements or bilinear quadrilateral elements, one point is enough. But if it's, again, distorted, then you may want to have more points, uh, integration points. And then you also have uh, for um, um, basically a, a higher order interpolation element, uh, basically take a second order element, then you need two points or four points to evaluate that integral exactly. So that's full integration for 2D. And for 1D, I just discussed it. This was also discussed previously, just reminding you about this because I need to cover some topics here. Reduce integration. Reduce integration, we found for Timoshenko as an example that it actually improved the solution because the full integration was act, making the element behave fairly stiff but by reducing the number of integration, we actually made it softer. We made it behave actually like the exact solution we found. Uh, so fewer points um, usually can be okay for undistorted elements, uh, but can increase the error, right? So uh, it can improve the solution for overly stiff elements like we found with Timoshenko beam. Um, and Q4 elements also become locked if you have just a single row of elements. Uh, we, we saw that it became stiff. The solutions will become stiff using one uh, reduced integration can help. Um, 
The problem with reviews integration, however, while it sounds attractive, especially for dynamic problems where you're doing uh, explicit time integration in Abacus or, or some of these uh, um, time intensive calculations, Abacus will try to default to a reduce integration element. Um, but the, the thing you need to pay attention to is the consequences of it. For example, if I use a quadratic interpolation with one point integration scheme, uh, that's clearly a reduced integration, right? Because uh, for quadratic interpolation, we need at least two points. Uh, but if I use one point instead, we found that when I evaluate, and we, we went over this, this is a reminder, when I evaluate this stiffness, uh, I get uh, basically, I go through the calculations and I find that this row, which belongs to the middle node, has zero. So I have zero stiffness. I have rigid body motion in that middle node. Uh, and so that's going to cause some numerical issues. Okay, so um, that, that is a problem. Okay. You guys follow? Let me explain some other issues you find with reduced integration. Uh, the issue is uh, you can get spurious modes. I will discuss it in a few minutes. Uh, and we call this our glassing. Uh, sometimes you get single, uh, singular matrices or zero energy. Uh, so, and the reason for that is because the reduced quadrature can lead uh, and, and fail to pick up deformations of the structure. Think about these Gaussian quadrature points as detection, the detection points inside that element. And so if that, if those no, if those quadrature points are not picking up the deformation of the structure, you may have an issue. I'll discuss that in a few minutes with an example. Uh, we call this rank deficient when this happens, when, when it's not able to pick up the behavior of, of, of the deformation of the, of, of the element. Um, zero energy motions, uh, which may not be rigid by motions, uh, are instabilities. We call them instabilities. Um, and they can cause errors in the strain energy. Uh, you can also have, uh, you, you usually don't have this issue with constant strain triangles because constant strain triangle, by definition, gives you a constant, constant uh, uh, stiffness matrix regardless. You don't have to evaluate that with Gaussian quadrature, right? We, we, we found this through homeworks and your, our experiences here. Um, anyway, so let, let me cover some examples here on, on this. So let's take a, a quad four. A quad four element, this is a very famous, uh, this, you know, I didn't put this together, this in many different books. Uh, you have, uh, if I calculated the eigen modes of a stiffness matrix, right? So how many, how many degrees of freedom I have in a Q4 element? Eight. Eight. Thank you very much. That was quick. Eight, right? So how many eigen modes I expect for, for that problem, for a single element? Eight, right? Eight, because I have two unknowns in each. Now, we're not talking, okay, so let, let me make sure you understand. These eigen modes are not the buckling modes. These are not the mode shapes of a dynamic problem. This is simply plotting the eigen modes of the stiffness matrix. Okay, calculating the eigen values and the, and the eigen modes of the stiffness matrix. So it's not a buckling problem or mode shape problem, dynamic problem. Um, we're just looking simply at the eigen modes of an element. And if I plot that, I get a rigid body motion along V. Makes sense. I should get a vertical motion. I get the axial motion uh, of this element that makes total sense. Or I have a rigid body rotation. Makes perfect sense. So these three can be suppressed, and you suppress that by uh, prescribing boundary conditions to your model. So if your model is not properly fixed, you should try these in Abacus. Don't fix your model and run it statically. You're going to have singularities. You're going to have a bunch of issues. So look at the dot message file. Take some of the models that we discussed in class. Don't fix it. And do a static calculation. You're going to see that the model is going to go haywire. It will give you some errors. Um, but now let's, let's look at uh, a single integration point, reduced integration for bilinear elements. So if I have, I'm an integration point down here, I'm a little ant in the middle of this quadrilateral. And I look that way, and I look that way, and I look that way, and I look that way. Do I see this moving outwards? I do, because I know I was here. This point can actually see that I was here, and I moved here. I was here, and I moved there. I can see I'm expanding. This element is expanding or contracting. Same here. If I'm this point here, this quadrature point here, I can also sense 
movement here. I can sense movement there. I can sense movement there. So this, a single quadrature point is going to pick up this behavior very well, which is basically stretching. It's picking this stretching very well. Now, if I'm a point here, okay, uh, it's also going to see that I have, I have shearing going on because I see a change in angle there, change in angle there, change in angle there, and change in angle there. So that single point, quadrature point, can actually pick up deformations four, five, and six very well. But when I'm talking about bending, which is what seven and eight is going to come out to be, uh, this is one of the modes you will get. If I'm this point here, tell me, can I sense movement there? No. Can I sense movement here? No. Can I sense movement there? No. Can I sense movement here? No. So what's going to happen, you're going to get something called an hourglass that looks like an hourglass, right? Um, and uh, this is going to cause errors, okay, uh, under bending conditions. That's why, that's why reduced integration for bending problems can be a problem sometimes, okay? And so now the behavior here is going to become singular or it's going to become too soft. The behavior may not be as good, okay? And so now, uh, if I were to look at uh, in a mesh, uh, you're going to get stuff like this. If I apply bending to this, this mesh, I only get stuff that looks like this. Nonsense, basically. Here you can see that with reduced integration, with brick elements, you can see some nonsense here when I apply bending loads to this uh, beam. You can try it at home. Just try it at home. Take C3D8R elements. By the way, C3D8R elements, I believe, is a default. So if I run an analysis and I apply a load, I'm going to get stuff that doesn't make any sense, okay? And some people don't look for these kind of things. They just run the models and just get the stress. They keep moving. Okay, your job is to be a police for fine elements, right? Uh, you should know better, okay? Uh, a full integration, however, does, did not suffer from these consequences. Now, I did not use C3D8 because C3D8 will, be, will behave stiff also. We discussed that. Even with full integration, C3D8 will become stiff, right? But if I now use reduced integration thinking I'll improve the solution, now I'm going to have a situation that's not the best either. So if now I use 20 node hex, everything matches very well, okay? And I can use 20 node hex uh, with a regular mesh or a not very nice mesh. In both cases, very nice results, okay? Any questions on this so far? Excellent. Um, don't think that with second order elements you don't have problems because you can have problems too. So uh, with uh, two, with four point quadrature points, I want you to see with me, check with me whether it's possible. And these are the modes. These are the modes for that, some of the modes, not all of them, uh, for that element. And so if I look at few modes, if I'm an integration point about here, can I sense movement there? Can I sense movement there? No. Can I sense movement? No, you, you won't be able to sense movement, and it's going to cause this weird uh, element deformation sometimes. And so you want to watch for that as well. These ones suffer from the same things too. Good news is that for second order elements, this, this behavior suppress usually when you have adjacent elements. So if I have this element, and I have another element here, and another element here, this mode is suppressed by adjacent elements, and this may not be an issue. But just keep your eyes open for it, okay? So uh, another thing that people do uh, to avoid an error, and Abacus has this approach, is, as I showed you, reduced integration can result in a problem. And so what Abacus does, or some many of these codes do, they provide you something called hourglass control. It allows you to add stiffness that's artificial, is made up to some level. Um, and the idea of adding the, this artificial stiffness is to suppress the spurious modes that, that occur. Okay? And so by adding this artificial stiffness, uh, you're able to, to, to mitigate these concerns. Uh, Abacus uses a, a, a formulation from a paper from Belichko in 1981. He came up with this. And so you guys can read that paper if interested. Or just read Abacus will give you some guidance on how to deal with hourglass control. 
my suggestion to you guys is to stick to full integration uh, if you want to not have to do deal with a lot of these things but then keep your eyes open for the issues that full integration can also give you but the minute you go to reduce the integration look out for overly overly flexible behavior things that don't make sense that's why hand calculation is so important in everything we do it's not just about running an fea model but also verifying your results okay um and here I explain some limitations of hourglass control uh, that could be of importance. Yeah, typically. For full integration, shear locking tends to be the problem. And then for reduced integration, the issues are zero energy modes or, or spurious oscillations and stresses. That can be a, an issue. Okay. Excellent. Any questions? Any questions here? Let's say you run it and you do get share locking, but you don't know it. Um, if you wanted to confirm that easier, would you just increase the number of elements? Or? Yeah, it, absolutely. You want to do a mesh refinement study to look to see if you got shear locking. Another thing you can do is hand calculations. There's something always, something simple you can always do. For example, I think somebody here ran. A, did you guys do problem number two? Uh, from here, yeah. Does it move? Does it move at all with triangular elements? I don't think this moves. You apply loading, it doesn't move. So if I was you, I'll run your model, right? Exaggerate the plot ten times, and if nothing is moving, you know there's a problem. I mean, right? This one is locking, as an example. But that alone is not enough. You have to do some Hancock to get some confidence, or do some mesh refinement studies to gain confidence in what you're doing. Okay. Um, uh, now, there are some tricks that, that exist in different finite element codes. It's called selective reduced integration. And so what you do here is, uh, when I have a bending problem, uh, you have no shear. So here, uh, if I use a single integration point, we can call it rank sufficient because it's not going to matter for this problem. Uh, although I'm not picking up uh, the shear here or here, I'm picking some here and here, but it's, it's not a problem for, for a bending problem, say. And then for uh, bending, though, you do have a problem. We call this rank insufficient. So here, what you could do is do full integration for these strains and then do reduce integration for the shear strain. And so now I'm selectively targeting the different strains differently. So what you do is you break up your stiffness matrix into two. You agree that this plus this gives me a total stiffness matrix? Yeah? So what you can do is evaluate. Remember the BDB matrix that we keep getting over and over? BDB, BDB. We, almost every problem is BDB. <laughs> if there's one thing you, you will be sleeping, I think for the next 50 years until you're no longer alive, is going to be BDB. That's the one thing you will remember from this class, BDB. And also, you remember the 10 steps in finite elements. All the t steps, right? I don't think you will forget. And if you do, uh, we have a problem. I I'll retroactively not give you an A, okay? <laughs> okay, call me up when you forget this stuff. I'll make sure your transcript gets changed, right? We could do that. No, we, we can't do that. But if you're gonna work in, fi if you're gonna work in finite elements, you really need to keep yourself sharp in all this subject, right? Because if, you, if this is what you're going to be doing, you don't want to get rusty. You want to go back and revisit some of the concepts here. Uh, but anyway, I can break up my stiffness matrix, right, into two. And this one here, I'll integrate fully, B, D, B, and I'll integrate this fully with full integration points, four integration points. And the shear term, the shear stiffness, I'll just integrate that with a single point. So that's called selective reduced integration. So to summarize, the sources of error typically tend to be user error, numerical error, modeling error, discretization error, and or quadrature error that's associated with the choice of integration scheme. Thank you for listening to this lecture, and I hope you learn about sources of error. We'll move on to the next special topic.